Welcome back to another North Carolina Tar Heels football podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. And if you're watching us on our fast-growing YouTube channel, that is called Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me is our jack-of-all-trades, Miss Dina King, and our grinder extraordinaire, Mr. Brandon P. Guys, we're here to talk about Carolina football. They're a week into fall camp, eighth day today, Friday, seventh practice a fall camp this morning. I just got back from Chapel Hill a little while ago, spent some time talking to Phil Longo afterward. We'll kind of get into that and some other things as well here in this podcast. But this is a fall camp podcast. One weekend, both of you have had a chance to see the team practice in person. Brandon, you and I were at the first two practices. Practice number one was open just to the media. Practice number two also to the public. So we were down on the field for that as well. Dean, of course, you were there Also, there are a lot of storylines to get into. There are a lot of position groups that have heated battles going on. We're going to get into all of that. Um, I talked to Phil Longo earlier today about the quarterbacks, about the running backs, about the wide receivers, about a bunch of stuff. We'll get into that as well. But before we do, very, very quickly, you have until Saturday night. If you want to get free access to TarHeelIllustrate.com and be a Tar Heel insider, you have till Saturday night to sign up, and it's just free, guys. It's a promo we've been running for the last week. You can sign up. You're, it's free for the rest of the month of August. That means you sign up, no strings attached, doesn't cost a dime, and you have full access to everything that we do through the end of August. And, guys, there are a lot of nuggets from camp that we're not putting on free content. We're not putting them on podcasts but we are putting them on the premium board. Plus, another one of the perks is later this month, we're going to have a Zoom for just premium subscribers. And those are some pretty good, the the people who've been on them will tell you a lot of information. I tell stories. I give some inside nuggets. Dina gives some recruiting nuggets. Heck, we get David Siska on there and we do basketball ones. He gives nuggets as well. But you can only be a part of it if you're a premium subscriber. And if you sign up, Take advantage of our free offer that makes you a premium subscriber. So come join uh, the THI community, hang out with us for the next month, and you can be an insider too. So guys, very quickly, Brandon, we'll start with you. Yes. A week into fall camp, what are a couple of things that jump out at you that you've seen from the Tar Heels so far? So one thing that jumps out to me that I've seen in the past the past week of going to practice is how how the the whole vibe of practice is much more serious is much more militant than it was in the spring i think in the spring the the whole idea was let the young guys learn let them learn how to be college players let them learn to adapt to the speed of the game and now when we went to the fall camp there's less there's less uh room for error the coaches are more strict about the small details and everything is just much more militant it, like there's consequences of making mistakes now they're they're fighting for positions and it's clear when you go out there and you watch it's clear with the energy of the team that they're everybody's fighting for a spot on the team and that that tip that typically happens when you have such a talented team because if you make a mistake literally one mistake could have you sitting on the bench for the rest of the year so when I was at practice I just I just saw an extra focus that I didn't see in the spring and I think that's a good thing for the team well they're closing in the start of the season and that generally happens but also I think a lot of it is there was a lot of stuff to clean up, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And I know that you watch defense a lot uh, during those two practices. Not only are they changing the scheme, but they have to teach a lot of fundamentals because they were so reliant on scheming and trying to out-scheme offenses before that lost in that process was a lot of the fundamental work that the guys need. So the Gene Chiswick way is a simpler scheme win your battles guys remember he says be really good at five things and not okay at 15 but in order to be really good you have to be near flawless with your fundamentals and they've been working a ton on fundamentals and i think that you might have guy a who's a little bit more talented than guy b but if guy b is more fundamentally sound and can be more trusted with what they're doing he's going to get on the field first and those are the battles i think that you're talking about dina what jumps out at you through the first week Piggybacking on that, Coach Chizik said that in his press conference about fundamentals. You know, uh, if we put you in a scheme and you don't even know the fundamentals, it's it's just useless. So I've seen uh, increase uh, fundamental skills and everything. And like Brandon said, just the overall focus and 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 the the energy level. Um, it's it's different, I believe. Uh, um, just going to the practice and seeing the guys, they they look they look like 
when you walk off the bus or the airplane that that's a very good football team. Now they got to go out on the field and do it. Well, there's no doubt they looked the part. Uh, to stay on the what Brandon was talking about as well, it, it, the simplification of what they're trying to do right now. Gene Chizik said the other day, a question I asked him, he said, they're searching for inches. And that's a direct quote. Searching for inches kind of goes like this. A year ago, everybody remembers all the pre-snap confusion. And they were getting multiple play calls in, in between offensive snaps. And then they had to decipher at times, which was the best one to use. And that's where so much of that confusion came from. How many times did we see, or see Jeremiah Gilman not even looking at the place, trying to get everybody on the same page? Because they have no idea basically what was going on. So when the ball snapped, they have to think and then react. They lose that space. They lose that split second, which is inches. Now... If they don't have that confusion in pre-snap, when the ball snap, they know where to go. It's so much more instinctive. They gain those inches back. So when he says searching for inches, he's talking about developing the instincts to, to make the play, to begin making the play as soon as the ball is snapped. That, to me, will be the biggest difference, what people see August 27th when they play Florida AM and as opposed to before. Because the Jack is sort of a hybrid guy. A lot of this stuff might look like a 4-2-5. It might look in pre-snap a little bit like it did before without the confusion. But once the ball snapped, that's where dudes are going to be allowed to be dudes. That jumped out at me at practice. That jumped out at me with the communication. Some of the different drills they're doing now as opposed to before. And that is my expectation. They should be quicker off the ball, simpler off the ball, less crap in their heads, and more decisive. Go get the ball. I think we're going to see a lot of that, guys. Yeah, and another thing is, I know we talk about this to our blue in the face about the simplification, but it's like last season, there were many times, like there was many times when we were in the press box and you would look at me and say, it looks like they're running completely different defenses. And and yeah. I, we learned recently that they actually were. I, like, I think but like what you're saying, very let me cut in. You're saying two different groups on the field. Yeah. Like yeah. five guys running one one thing, one call, six guys running another call. Go ahead. And the problem is it would be within like, Within the secondary, like two corner, the corners might be running one coverage and the safety might be running another coverage, which is what led to that to that late game touchdown to NC State. So if you're a corner and you're playing a zone coverage and your safety thinks you're playing a man, he might not come over, he might not roll over as hard for the help because he thinks you're man to man. But if you think you're in coverage, you got underneath and you just let the receiver run past you, it's going to end up in a touchdown. And then I think, and then that leads to distrust within the group. And I think the simplification of the communication will really help them trust each other. And it will, we should see better results this season for, for it. Dina, when you listen to the defensive players talk about these things, and they're asked a lot of questions about the simplification. And I like to ask sort of broad ones to see what first comes out of their mouth. Boy, it's almost like they're rehearsed. And I say that in a good way, because I don't think they are rehearsed right now with what to say. I just think that the process has been scaled down so much that there are only a few things that they can say, and they're all right on point when we talk to them about it. Most of those words, we've, we've already used simplicity, more communication, you know, better communication, because, uh, you know, they're, they're, one, they're, they're one group out there, and it all has to be, you know, aligned for everything to work. Uh, you know, you, your cornerbacks need to know what your linebackers are going to do and your defensive end, so... Yeah, every time we've had a defensive player on the the interviews, uh, those words come out, and and they like this new style that Coach Chiswick and Coach Warren has brought, and and I think they're going to see some really positive results on the field this year. Dina, what's another thing that has jumped out to you about the first week of fall camp? Well, just uh, I think you know last year there was a lot of a lot of hype. You know, and this year, I think they're they're flying under the radar. I mean, they have a chance to do really good. I mean, their schedule is a, a you know a good schedule, but I think they're more focused. And like Brandon said, you know, you, the 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 battles, and you you do one thing, you're going to fall on the on the depth chart. So they've built a lot of depth through these recruiting classes they've got, but, but they got a lot of youth in a, in a lot of that depth too. So they got to, they got to get some of them reps and everything and let that uh, inexperienced kids, you know, because 
they're talented. Gosh, they're talented. They got they got so, you know, I think they have a four star in each group out there now. And yeah. we couldn't say that for for a few years. So uh, the talents there, they just they gotta everybody come together and and uh, come be a complete group and everything. I mean, the coaches say they're all on the same page and I guess we'll see that against Florida A and M. How that will look, I, Brandon. I, I've been I've been going to fall camp since the '90s, since the late '90s when I got into this business. And I remember I was at Carl Torbush's first fall camp. But I've gone to fall camps a lot of different programs. And when I covered the ACC for Fox, I I went to a few at Clemson, Virginia Tech, throughout the state of North Carolina. And of course, I I saw some of Max Late teams. I saw some of the really good Butch teams, these really talented Butch teams, and where this program is now. And there aren't many cases in which I saw the kinds of young guys in uniform practicing that are still wet behind the ears, but good gracious, they jump out at you as you have right now at North Carolina. We can list a bunch of these guys if we want, but for your, you're much newer in this. When you're at, you're at practice last Friday, when you're at practice last Saturday, how much did the young guys, the true freshmen, whether they came in January or they just got here in June, how much did those guys jump out to you? And what were your initial observations of some of those dudes? All right. So, they, yeah, they, those guys are obviously a very talented group. They were one of the top ranked recruiting classes in the country. Guys like Andre Green, Travis Shaw, Bo Atkinson, Zach Rice, those are the guys, those are the guys specifically that stand out of my mind that has have less of a transition to make to the high school I mean to the college game from the high school game and especially Andre Green you, I, me personally I like to it's hard for me to be convinced that a freshman anything is going to be good their first year but it's hard to it's hard to ignore his talent when he's out there he looks like the most physically gifted receiver out there already he's he's already making one of the biggest things that was a problem with UNC receivers last year year is is more than just a separation is because you know as a receiver on the division one level you not always want to create separation so you have to be able to catch contested passes and I think Andre Green comes in day one could be the best contested pass catcher that this team has and I think that it's something they really need maybe outside of Bryson Nesbitt we haven't seen that yet but we'll see well, you got to be able to get inside a DB as well you have to be strong enough and you have to be able to to, to establish ownership of space he could let's stay on Andre Green for a minute because when I walk, when I remember you and I were a little early for practice last Friday, they said, you know, you got to go back outside the gate, come in in a few minutes. <laughs> so when we came back in and they started doing some basic drills, he, he popped. I didn't have to look for him. And it's like, wow, that's Andre Green because he wasn't there in the spring. So we didn't get a chance to see him then. And now you go that even today after practice when we're talking to Phil Longo and they're breaking up, it's like, oh, there's there he is. He just kind of jumps out at you because he's a different kind of dude. They haven't had guys that are built like him, that run like him, that have the the length he has, guys that can cover every that can run every route, or certainly will soon be able to run every route. And he's got a lot to work on. I asked Phil today about him, and you could tell he was almost tempering his enthusiasm. Because you don't want to look, they've only been in full pads once. They were in shorts and shoulder pads today, shoulder pads and helmets. They'll be in full pads again Saturday when they scrimmage over in the stadium. So that'll be their second time in full pads. They'll learn a lot about Andre Green then, of course. But based on what we've seen, and Phil did acknowledge that he is in the rotation right now, I do think we'll see him. And I think by the time they get we get to late September, we're going to see him a lot, Dina. We're going to see Andre Green get. 30, 40 snaps, where a lot of routes, get a lot of targets, and maybe even more. I think he's got that next level type of stuff. And as good as that room is, and it's much better now than it was a year ago, you just don't bring in guys like Andre Green very well. He's going to stand out and play a lot this year. Coach Longo said today, you know, uh, he 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 was talking about how strong Andre is. That's that's yeah. one thing that's in his favor and he compared him kind of a lot with Gavin Blackwell coming in as a freshman compared him to to Andre and Gavin has worked on his strength and so Gavin uh, we seen that Saturday he had, he had a really good practice making some great plays but Andre he's one thing about Carolina's receivers they they got some variety variety now with 
Andre Green being like 6'3", one of the tall guys that can deep threat. And then you have Josh Downs that, uh, you know, we, we all know what Josh can do. And then we have uh, Antoine Green we can talk about. It hadn't started making major moves later in the season. And J.J. Jones is in the mix, Gavin Blackwell, um, Ty Chapman, Saw him doing some good things at yeah. He at, darts. At practice. He darts, guys. Yeah, he darts. Yeah, and uh, so I, I'm sure I'm leaving someone out. Uh, and of course, you know, where they're going, you know, where they line Bryce, Bryce and Nesbitt at. So, uh, Coach Longo has to be excited about you know the progression of his wide receiver room because uh, um, Josh is going to have some help this year. No doubt. Brandon, you mentioned Bo Atkinson. Uh, Cayman Rucker was asked the other day after practice, may have been yesterday, about maybe one of the newcomers that has surprised him or people should keep an eye on. He mentioned Bo Atkinson. Now, he did say, look, he's my fall camp roommate, so he's gotten to know him and he's given him a little push. But he's another guy that jumped out at me first practice. You and I were standing right next to each other. We were like eight feet away from when when they were doing some drills. And he re- he looks like he's been in college a while. And some of the other guys are bringing him up, too, because he's athletic. He was a tight end as well in high school, and he's sort of a rangy guy, but he's strong. He's already got a good base of strength for him as a true freshman. I would be surprised to see him get some reps, certainly early in the year, when they have some games that they should be able to win if they're able to take care of business. But I think he has a chance at playing himself into a a position, a, a spot where he gets 10, 12, 15 reps in contested games by late October. Yeah, especially yeah, especially after that bye week. Um, I w- actually I wasn't when when Cayman Rucker said the other day that he took Bo Atkinson under his wing. It, everything kind of made sense to me because when you when I watch Bo Atkinson play, he he plays with such like a tenacity and uh, I don't want to say anger, but it's just so every, like everything he does is full speed, and that's exactly how Cayman Rucker is, and that's why Cayman Rucker always whenever I watch a UNC football game, I've, I've been rewatching in every football game from 2020 2021 every time Cayman Rucker is on the field he pop like he pops out on the field to me he's either collapsing the pocket he's getting back there and I think he's taking Bo Atkinson under his wing giving him some giving him that chip on the shoulder that Cayman Rucker might have for being an undersized player or maybe an under recruited player he's giving it to Bo Atkinson a bigger much a t- more talented guy so if he could get that mentality into him he could be he has a chance to be a very special player for the Tar Heels well Cayman gets off the snap really quickly really good and, and Bo does too I think part of that is, you know, Leesville Road used him a lot in the passing game. Mm-hmm. And they used him in a variety of ways. So he, I, I think playing that has helped him as far as getting off the ball quickly. And that's what we saw certainly in those two practices. Dina, you wanted to say something as well about that. Well, like you said, Bo, a really good athlete. So uh, um, tall, you know, I remember the first time I saw him, I was like, good gracious you know, uh, was nicknamed Thor, you know, a little yes, blonde hair, right. but he cut it off, you know, and stuff. But a couple of players that I got to, young guys that I got to watch a lot on that Saturday was in the offensive line, you know, Zach Rice and Trayvon Green. Both of those guys are doing well. You know, Zach was working with the ones and, um, you know, we, we've heard Coach Big Nail talk about cross training and I think Zach Zach training at guard and tackle um he wants he wants his his goals to be in the NFL and um you know uh, being cross trained like that is helps him in the long run and uh I, I I just sat there and watched and if you didn't know Zach Rice you would just think he was an upperclassman because he just you know, he looks looks like he's been in the program a couple of years. So, and you know, the coaches they keep bragging about Travion Green, and you know, we personally, after following his recruitment, know the the story behind him and him losing a lot of weight, and Carolina sticking with him and making that promise. You know, if you you lose this weight, you, we got a spot for you, and he's a very hard worker. And I, I'm just tickled to see him out there and competing like he was Saturday. Guys are, are naming Travion Green when they talk about some of the dudes that are st- a step standing out as far as that. When we talk to the older players about which young guys are standing out, 
Brandon, you were an offensive lineman in high school. You you know the position pretty well, or all the different positions pretty well. The thing that has really struck me about Zach, what we found out what we, they were doing the cross training last week and got to see him work a lot at guard, but he's rotating like with the ones at, at right guard and right tackle. And, and part of this is that they're waiting for Spencer Rowland to kind of catch up. When we talked to Spencer the other day, and he's in the process of catching up, catching up meaning he's been – Ivy League, Harvard all this time. So he's getting used to the speed and physicality at the snap every down at this level. And and by, from my understanding is he's doing a terrific job. And the belief is he'll probably eventually start. If he does, you slide Zach in and maybe start him at right guard. And I say that, I, I've never talked about a true freshman starting on the offensive line in my life before. But it looks like that could be happening here. At the very least, he could be the primary backup at right guard and right tackle, get a lot of snaps, because I think they want to play eight or nine. They want to keep these guys fresh so they could be really strong in the fourth quarter. Uh, and, of course, there's the William Barnes factor in there. But I just like the fact that, Dina, you said cross-training for the NFL. I think they're also cross-training to make this team mm-hmm. right now better when they take the field August 27th. Because I, I think if you're going to look at their top eight offensive linemen, if they could take eight to battle, say these are the eight you got to win, the most important game you've ever played with, Zach Rice is going to be among those eight guys. Yeah. Uh, typically for me, this is just a personal belief of mine. I, I say as a freshman in college football, the further away you are from the ball, like when the ball is set, the easier it is for you to get on the field early. So corners, receivers, safeties, they can get on the, it's easier for them to get on the field earlier. I think yeah. it's like for an offensive lineman to get on the field as a true freshman, you have to be a generational player. Like it's not, it's not, I'm pretty sure you can probably count on both hands how many true off, true freshman offensive linemen got significant snaps last season. But I do think Zach Rice is one of those generational talents, just a combination of size and athleticism. And I believe I, he has been getting uh, snaps at left, uh, right guard and right tackle. I believe the best version of this team this season specifically has Spencer Rowland playing right tackle and they sliding uh, Zach Rice down to right guard just for this year and then maybe next year. Obviously, he's going to develop into a star tackle eventually. But I think as a true freshman, to get on the field at guard, I think guard might be the easiest position for a true freshman to play. It might be the easiest transition for him to make. And, one thing, and, and, you know, and Rowland has two years of eligibility left, by the way. So Zach could start at right guard now or play a lot at right guard and slide over to left tackle behind after yep. Awesome Richards leaves next year, although Awesome couldn't use the COVID year and come back, so who knows what will happen with that. But I agree with you. I think it's a great line about the further away you get from get away from the <laughs> ball. I heard that a long time ago. I think maybe I heard it from a coach. I don't remember. It'd be if I heard it from a coach, that's even more props to you on that one. But that is so true. Know. But I guarantee you, anybody who who's been around college football uh, fairly closely will, will, was nodding when you said that because I think it's totally true. But Zach has the potential to be a generational type guy, but also Travion Green, you know, his length, when I saw him at practice last Friday, and then I looked, I was watching him a little bit on Saturday, true freshman. He doesn't look at, doesn't carry himself like it. He's kind of walking around out there like, yeah, I'm in the rotation or I'm I'm in the two deep. I should be in the two deep because that's me. And I think that with him, Dina, and you've known him for a while, they could have found themselves somebody like they did, like the previous staff did with Marcus McKeithen, who was way underappreciated when it came to the star rankings and stuff. Because I think Travion Green has a chance to be really, really good. Maybe not this year, but certainly in 24 or 23, 24, uh, those seasons when he gets a little bit older. And what helps these young offensive linemen, they're getting to go against probably the most, I think, and you guys, y'all, y'all, do you opinion too? I think the defensive line in Carolina is their strong point, and they're going they're going to go against you know the Miles Murphys and the Javal Ritzies and uh, Travis Shaw, and uh, when mm-hmm. Ray Vahasic gets back, you know all those defensive linemen, Keyshawn Silver. So they're 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 learning against some some very good quality competition there on the defensive side of the ball. So uh, I know we picked at each other last year well with our recruiting podcast that a lot of people would love to see uh, Zach and Travis Shaw go one-on-one and you know that's a battle of two five stars a lot of people would like to see that and um, so that it, it only will going to make each other better going against kids like that I want to see that on Monday Brandon 
Let's remember yeah. to look for that. <laughs> you brought up defense, and let's we're talking about some of the young guys. Uh, we'll go to Travis Shaw. Travis is going to be in the mix, obviously. And he looks like he's got some work to do, some fundamentals showing up based on some of the stuff we were seeing. But the thing that I like about his situation, and I noted this in the pod that Jacob and I did last week from the football center after that practice, is that there's no pressure on Travis to step in August 27th and give him 50 snaps and, and be a run stopper and, and, and a guy who clogs up gaps and occupies blockers. He's got time to become that dude because of all the other dudes that they have up front. And I think because of that, we're going to see a process with him, but it's going to be pretty swift because he's so talented, but it's going to be a process. I think the guy that takes the field in November, is going to be a lot better than the guy that takes the field in September. And they're going to allow him room to grow instead of throwing him out there, have him get his butt kicked. He loses some confidence and sometimes it stagnates a guy's growth. Sometimes they're better off getting 12 snaps and watching the rest and seeing how the game unfolds in front of them instead of just being thrown to the wolves and getting a ton of reps. That is what I think is going to happen with Travis, Brandon. Yeah. Um, Mac Brown last year, previous year, he's always talking about he wanted to create enough de- create enough depth where he could play God situationally. And I think Travis is a, one of those is a perfect guy to put in situationally. Third and 10, you need somebody big in the middle that can still get after the quarterback. I think he would be a good candidate. So I, I, I agree with you. He's not going to play. 60, 70 snaps a game, but I think the snaps he's going to get in in certain situations, and when he gets in, he's going to be in to do a specific thing. And like, and right now, as a true freshman, him just focusing on, all right, you go in, I want you to get after the quarterback, or you go in and I want you to take ownership of your two-yard box. Whatever they want him to do, just have, just this year for him focusing on one thing will be really good for his development, and he can go ahead and master some skills this year. Staying on the D-line, staying on the D-line, guys – player that's really just like wow pops is javari ritzy he's only in his second year and i was watching that acc tour thing that uh they, they were in chapel hill the other day and and mac was asked who are the leaders on defense and he actually mentioned javari ritzy he mentioned the second year guy he also mentioned power echoes and it speaks to how young the defense is when you have two guys that you know, we're, we're early enrollees 18 months ago as two of the vocal dudes on defense, but they're also special talents. Yeah. And they're the kinds of personalities I think that can handle that. They're a little bit more mature, more, certainly sure of themselves. They can handle that. But Javari is somebody to me that I think is maybe the most interesting guy on defense. We all know Miles Murphy's excellent. And Miles is projected to be late in uh, first round draft pick by a lot of people next spring. But Javari's the guy that might have another layer that he can get to. And I thought it was interesting when we talked to Geo Biggers the other day. Uh, I asked him, I, I said, okay, go back to what the, the guys up front looked like when you got here. Now, when you take a look at the guys up front, what are some of the differences? And talking about their size and their speed and their quickness, quickness but he went to Javari and he said he can do the splits. He could do the splits, man. And he can leap. Javari is an unbelievable athlete. He's in the 290, 295 range. His quickness, sort of like with Rucker, a lot, quickness off the snap, allows him to be really effective, even, even though some people might think he's a little undersized with weight. But I think that you got to play to who you are. And that's who he is right now. He's a 290, 295 pound guy, but he is cat quick. Brandon, we were watching some of those drills. Murphy was flawless in his drills, but Ritzy was so bouncy and quick. And 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 I'm, and my understanding is that he's learning to play with power. And if you if you're that athlete and you're 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 bouncy in the right kind of way and you're quick and you're agile and you've got great lateral movement and you're learning to play with power, that's how you go from being really good and situationally really good to being damn good. And I think Javari Ritzy might be on the path to becoming damn good. Yeah, I agree. We I, talk about you know. Carolina recruit multi-sport athletes. Well, with Ritzy's case, how many guys, how many guys that big defensive lineman ran cross country? You know, yeah. that's that's shot shot put cross country basketball in high school. That, that that's stuff. what type of kid he is, you know, and comes from, you know, a great family. And mom was, you know, a coach as well. So uh, I expect J- uh, Javari to, you know, well, coming into the when he come in as a freshman you know a lot of a lot of people uh, you know n- nothing against uh, Keyshawn Silver but Silver was getting a lot of the 
recognition and everything. And a lot of people didn't know much about J Javari, but they they know Javari now. I mean, he he's going. I think he's going to have a great year, and uh, he's a, a athletic and can cause major havoc. So, um, looking forward to a big year for Javari. Brandon, you want to chime in on that? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say pound for pound, probably outside of Travis Shaw, Javari Rissi is probably the best athlete, but you guys just went over that. He's the best athlete. I think he's the best, best athlete, definitely on the defensive line. I was, it's it's hard to tell because I haven't seen Travis Shaw in the game, but I think I think Javari Rissi is definitely among the best, one of the best pound for pound <laughs> athletes on the team. The way he, he moves so fluidly and he's only a true sophomore and everything he does, it's like, you should, you should be seeing the things that he does. You should be seeing that out of juniors and seniors, but I think he's so far ahead of the curve. Like he's, I, there's a lot of guys that we were sent. We were sent the preseason. Uh, we voted for the preseason, all ACC team. There's a lot of guys that weren't on the list that I believe will be on the postseason list. And I believe Javari Ritz, he is one of those guys. That, like, By the way, before we continue on, I want to talk running backs and I want to talk quarterback and all that coming on. Just a quick reminder, if you guys are watching this video, you have until Saturday night to go ahead and take advantage of our offer to have a free premium subscription to Tar Heel Illustrated through the end of August. That means everything we do, if you sign up right now, you have access to everything we do to the end of the month. It means you can be a Tar Heel insider too. Make sure you enter the promo code Pro, promo code uh, kickoff 2022 kickoff 2022 and it gets you in free everything and the stuff that we're talking about here we're on the boards doing this and we go into great detail and we're constantly fielding questions on the boards so if our subscribers tag dean in a question about this or tag brandon or tag me we'll go into a long length lengthy discussion about these kinds of things where we will offer a lot more tidbits and you're going to get here on these podcasts. So make sure you go over to tariillustrate.com. Above the headlines, there's a little thing up there, a little link says you can become get it for free. Click that, sign up, and you can be a Tar Heel Insider too for the rest of August. And if you choose to sign up after that, it's just day 33 a month. You can be a Tar Heel Insider in perpetuity, just like Dina, just like Brandon are. So guys, offensively, let's go back to running back here. Phil Longo was asked today uh, who's standing out in that room and his immediate response was, well, tell me what day it is. In other yeah. words, it's Caleb Hood one day, it's DJ Jones one day, it's British Brooks one day, it's Elijah Green one day, and also George Petaway and Omar and Hampton, the latter two true freshmen who are very highly touted when they came in. I do believe that in some ways this has been a six-man race yeah. because I because the thing that I have taken from our interviews with the players what I've seen talking to the coaches is that these guys are all good, but they're each a little bit unique. I believe it was DJ Jones said, you know, we've all got different skills that we bring to the table. Uh, he said it might turn out to be is either DJ or it was Elijah Green said earlier this week. It might be who meshes best with the offensive line. And Brandon, you could speak to that as a former offensive lineman. Sometimes certain backs just kind of fit with certain line uh, better than other guys, even if another guy might be a little bit more talented, a little bit more explosive, but their chemistry is there. It's like in basketball. Sometimes it's not the five best players on the court. It's the five that work the best. Football is very much the same way. Yeah, I agree. The The running back rotation is up to six they have six people buying for three spots we said two or three spots right now and with the way that the transfer portal is in 2022 if they have six the re, there's a reason the six guys are still here like the like they didn't think they if they didn't have a legitimate shot of cracking that rotation i don't think they would be here so i think the competition in the running back is just as fierce as any other uh, any other position battle on the roster i think they're full of talent i do believe once the true freshmen get up to speed with pass blocking because i do believe that's the most underrated aspect of a running back. You have to be able to protect your quarterback. Once they get up to speed to pass block, I think it's going to be really hard to keep those two, George Petaway and Omari Hempen off the field. It's just too much talent there. Too Dana, much Dana two guys in particular I want to ask you about, DJ Jones and Elijah Green. DJ told us the other day that you know, he was banged up with injuries his first two years, and it affected him, it affected him up here. And he said that he's now playing loose. It's not in his mind anymore. Because of that, he's quicker. Some of the other guys said, man, DJ can dart. He could shift gears and change direction on dime. And if you're thinking you went through an injury when you were in college playing basketball, you hurt your knee. When you come out of an injury, 
And he remember, he didn't start the Orange Bowl because he broke his foot. He would have been the starter in the Orange Bowl. And we maybe would have seen a little bit of a D DJ Jones uh, since then. When you're coming off an injury, it takes time for different guys to get through the mental hurdle. He's through that now. I know you alluded to the injury that you had in high school, but or in college rather. How much did that can that affect an athlete when their mind isn't right and it makes their body slower and less instinctive? Yeah, I, I mean, I know when I first came out, it was just, you know, it constantly when I heard it, you know, am I going to hurt it again? Do I go hard? You know, th those kind of questions. Uh, and, and, it, and it, you know, it affects, you know, you can't help your human nature to, to think about things. But um, with DJ, you know, being being injured, I know it, it has affected him. But I'm glad to hear that, you know, he's he's very positive. And, you know, like you said, he, he – he would have probably had a really good year this past year if he had not got injured as well. So um, just, to, you know, you, you can't – you just have to focus on the, the goal and, you know, what happens happens. And I, I think uh, the running back room is very strong, got a lot of talent. But I do believe that uh, British Brooks is, is up here at the top because he's the most experienced in uh, blocking, uh, pass blocking. They, they're going to need that, especially with a new quarterback and, you know, some, you know, line, you know, basically a, a, a brand new offensive line. So uh, the offense, you, you're going to have to to have British back there because he, he's been there and been in the trenches and, blocking and uh did a did a really good job at the end of the season so and and i agree all of them all of them have a uh, are versatile i mean they all have their their special speciality or something in their game so um, I, i'm really high on on marion you know being a, a, a local kid uh, that did not he does not look like a freshman he yeah, like kind of like Zach Rice. If you didn't know who he was, you would think he was a, probably a three-year starter at mm -hmm. a Power Five uh, school. George Petway, he 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 does everything great in the backfield, catching the ball out of the backfield, and very speedy. So, uh, you know, and then you got your power guy and Caleb Hood and Elijah Green's in there, very fast running back. So they got a lot of options yeah. there. We talk about options and stuff, sports. Yeah. Uh, um, Coach Brennan, Porter I, has a lot of options. Brennan, I want to ask you about Elijah Green. I'll go ahead and ask you about that in a second since you brought him up a few minutes ago. Uh, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm cheating here. I'm looking at some notes here about, because I was working on a running backs piece earlier today. So I'm going to go ahead and look at these now, if my eyes will allow me to see it without <laughs> wearing my glasses. Interesting that you say the British is the most experienced guy because actually DJ Jones has 262 snaps on offense. British has, or excuse me, DJ Jones has 242. British only has 98 in his career on offense, mm -hmm. which, uh, or, or excuse me, 98 last year, 156 in his career. And DJ had 22 years ago. So DJ's played a lot, but I, I do think that speaking to British's maturity and the fact he's been on the field, he also has 600. 75 snaps on special teams that, so well that's what there. kind of what i was yeah. getting at yeah I, I know exactly what you're talking about but i think it's interesting that he hasn't played a whole lot at running back i think he was the he was the number one guy coming out of spring practice because they needed a leader in that room and he's the perfect guy to lead that room he was the perfect guy to guide them through the plps throughout the summer but i'm not entirely convinced he's the he's rb1 when they get into October, maybe he stays that way for a while. And in the end, it's one of those deals where a guy starts in basketball, but maybe plays 18 minutes and someone else plays more minutes in his spot or something like that. I think it's, it's really open. And you mentioned the two freshmen, but here's a guy to look out for Elijah green. Some of the teammates are talking about Elijah, Brandon, you mentioned something a few minutes ago about pass protection in high school. He played an offense that never threw the ball. He, he got the call. He never run a pass route in his life. He never had to run a pass route. He learned how to catch the ball. And Phil Longo said today that he has caught up, and, and Elijah told us the other day he's caught up as well. And Elijah actually said the other uh, the other day, he said in the spring, he picked up a fire blitz late in the spring practice, and that's when he realized, you know what, 
I can pass protect at the level I need to. Phil confirmed that today. He said Elijah's caught up now, and he's he might be might be the 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 quickest step through the hole, quick most explosive guy through the hole on the team. So what do you think about Elijah Green being the dark horse guy that ends up getting a lot of the workload this year, Brandon? I mean, Elijah Green is a guy that many people don't talk about when they're speaking on the running back depth. He's been a, he's been in the program for a while. He Elijah Green is the kind of player that you would you want in the program, a guy that comes, he learns he sits behind really good backs. He develops, he develops, he develops. And then one year he gets his opportunity. And this could be his opportunity. I mean, it's hard to break that running back rotation because there's it's so many people. But the experience and then him learning how to pass protect, him learning how to run routes and catch the ball, him being more comfortable catching more balls out the backfield. Obviously, he's a good runner. He's, he's at North Carolina for a reason. I think all these guys, if you put the ball in their hands, they can make something happen. Like, you don't get to this level without being able to do that. But him learning all the small details that come with playing the running back position is only going to benefit him to, as the season goes on. And even Smart if he's a kid. Oh, right. go ahead. I was going to say, even if, he doesn't, even, if he's, if he, even if he isn't a part of the first three on the first game, like, running backs go down all the time. Like, he can, he can break that rotation eventually throughout the season. Let, smart kid, let me smart clarify kid too. about Bridges. Let me clarify yeah. my point about Bridges Brooks. You know, he's a consummate team player. And if somebody, one of the young guys starts, their stock starts going up. You know, he he's their best player on special teams. Yeah. And I, I see him as being a leader of that team, saying, Hey, you know, even going to the coach, hey. You know, if, if so-and-so's doing good, you know, it's not going to bother him. He just wants the team to win. So that's that's why I said British yeah. may be number one, but like you said, understood, by mid, understood. Can you I know, yeah, yeah, I, what I was doing, I was more clearing up that some mm-hmm. people may not realize that DJ has played a lot more snaps offensively than British has. Um, real quickly about Elijah Green, really smart kid three-time state champion of Georgia. He's a winner. There, there, there are intangibles, I think. Now that he can pass block, now he can pick up that fire blitz, which he said, and Phil Longo confirmed, he can run routes, and he's working out every day after practice with the jugs or with the quarterback. I, I think he's a dark horse guy to keep an eye on. He may not be in the rotation at all. We don't know. It's going to be a tough decision for them to make. But I legitimately believe that they have six options. And I thought it was interesting that when Phil was asked about that room day, the first guy that came to his mind was Caleb Hood. Now, tomorrow it might be Elijah Green. It might be Marion Hampton. But, Dina, you were also right when you kept telling me about Marion. He's so big, Andrew. He's real good. People just going to love the fact he can combine power and speed. And watching him in practice, he absolutely combines that. Let's shift gears to quarterback. Oof. So I put up a piece on the site about an hour, well, about 45 minutes or so before we started recording this pod. Uh, Talked to Phil extensively today about the quarterback position, about uh, a lot of different things that have to do with not just, hey, who's looking better, coach? But one of the things that that I asked him is something we've talked about a little bit on some of our pods. You know, neither one of these guys has really played much in three years. Jacoby Criswell and Drake May. Jacoby, obviously, this is his third year in the program. So it's been since his senior year in high school, since he consistently got game reps and saw live action. Okay. He he, obviously they each played half of the Wofford game last year. That was a bad FCS team. And they've had a few snippets here and there, but it's not extensive, consistent playing time. Drake didn't even have a senior season. Mm. So because North Carolina didn't have fall high school football that year because of COVID he, he enrolled early. So he missed his whole senior season. So it's been almost three years for him as well. The competition right now, the way that they're grading every step these guys take, they're charting literally everything that they do. The competition is so intense right now that part of this, I think, is really healthy. And even if they know who the quarterback is or is going to be, they're going to string this out some because the it helps sharpen their edge. They need this grind. They need this daily battle. Both Whoever's going to win out to be as sharp and have the edge that they need when the games actually get here. Cause neither one of them has seen a lot of live fire in the last three years. And because of that, I think they're handling it really well. And and I'm not saying that they know for sure who the QB is going to be in there. And people might say, well, they're stringing another guy along. I don't believe that at all. I do think it's a battle. I do think someone might have an edge, but I do think it's a battle, but more important, whoever the quarterback is going to be, 
they are going to be as tested as you possibly can, having not really taken many significant snaps in three years. Brandon, why don't you run with that first? So the uh, the Carolina they recently put on their pad their pads uh, and I, I believe it was the fifth practice they put on full pads six one it was Thursday Thursday they had half a full pad practice yeah 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 okay so so I think the the quarterback battle is going to start heating up from that point until the beginning or till whenever they name a starter because it's hard to evaluate quarterbacks in shorts and t-shirts because it's hard to see who's really moving the offense who really has the defense off balance and it's hard to and I know they don't get hit in practice but there's a difference between Des Evans coming at you in full pads and Des Evans in a t-shirt and shorts on I, I know you're still not gonna get hit regardless but I think with the full pads the play they, they allow the plays to go on a little bit longer to see how the quarterbacks would possibly escape the pressure with the shorts and the t-shirt it's like as soon as somebody gets it's back there. It's like, all right, it's, it's over. Like they don't even, you just got to put one finger on the quarterback and it's a sack. I think the, the coaching staff will let the plays play out a little bit longer to see how the quarterbacks deal with real pressure in their face. And I think, I think that will be the, the ultimate determinant factor. I mean, obviously who can move the ball better, who produces more in the offense is going to get the nod, but I think it comes down, quarterback play comes down to being able to do, be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And whoever, I'm going to go a step further. Brandon, I'm going to go a step further than that. Dean, I want you to respond to this. Brandon, you can respond to it afterward as well, after her. I think it's more than just that. It's how the structure is disrupted when you're in full contact. You can't hit the quarterback, but the tight ends can be hit. The running backs can be hit. The receivers, the corners can hit them at the line full throttle, like it's game speed and disrupt their route. So what quarterback adapts to what happens to the patterns and the way things break up? What quarterback adapts to having to to flush is when he's flushed right a little bit quicker than he is when they're going in Skelly or something like that. I think that's the guy that wins the job in the end. So Brandon, you're right, and and the, that you know, Des Evans is hitting tackle. Yeah, they're popping. Yeah. So all that's there. They're not going to hit the quarterback. But I think it's all how do you react to everything happening before you're in the throw moment? When you're in that throw moment, where are you? Where is your feet? Where are your eyes? How are you adapting to what doesn't go according to plan? What doesn't go according to script? That's the guy that wins the job. What do you think, Dana? Yeah, Coach Longo talked today about, you know, both both Jacoby and Drake are uh, mobile. You know, I mean, they can, they can make plays, you know, out of the pocket, you know, if they get flushed, they can, they can make plays, but, you know, he, he really, he made a statement talking about Drake. Well, you know, he's like, I don't know why nobody thought he could, he could run, you know, uh, everybody had him as a, a pro style quarterback and the dude can run. And, and, you know, I saw him in high school and I, I, I told you back when watching him, I'm like, you know, he reminds me of certain someone when, yep. when he gets out, out of the pocket and running. Of course, that guy is playing in the NFL right now. But you know, it, it, it's it's. I, I believe you know who makes the plays. Like Brandon says, who who uh, is more successful? You know, who the who looks the most comfortable? Because you know, you're the focal point of the offense. You got it. You got to you got to produce in in in, in everything. And I do think naming a starter a little bit earlier will, will help because the one that, that is named this QB one is going to have to bond a lot with, cause there's a lot of new parts, you know, you, you, you got some new backs, you got some new linemen, you got some new wide receivers. So um, it, it's a, uh, it's, it's interesting to see who's going to, who and when they're going to do this. Brandon, what are your thoughts on the on them looking for the QB that handles stuff when and when things break down? Yeah, I mean, obviously that's going to be the number one. That has to be one of the top priorities when you're looking for a starting quarterback. And I think the the coaching staff for UNC is in a pretty good position because let's say they choose Jacoby Criswell to be their starting quarterback. And then Jacoby Criswell goes out against AM and throws three interceptions. They still have Drake May on the bench. They still have the other guy that they that they can bring in and see, oh, maybe this guy can do it. So I think they're in a really good position because they have depth and they have they have quarterbacks, and there's not going to be much of a drop-off between them. But yeah, like you said, the, the guy who can who can be comfortable in the chaotic situations are going is going to be the guy. That's I mean, it, it really boils down to that because you have to 
as a quarterback, as a leader, things are going to go wrong and your player, your teammates are going to look to you and you have to be, you have to have the same demeanor. You have to be ready to go after every play, you know? I have a theory and we've talked about, I've talked about this with both of you when we don't have the record button, button going, but <laughs> we heard from Mac in the spring. We certainly heard from him at a, the ACC kickoff. Brandon, you and I were with him at the ACC kickoff in Charlotte a couple of weeks ago where he was like, hey, I'm not afraid to use two guys. We'll use two. We'll, we'll start it out using two guys if we have to. He was sort of pitching the using two guy thing quite a bit. But after the first practice last Friday, he tweaked that a little bit. And Phil came down and said today, look, we talk about it. Mac would like to name one a little bit sooner. I think the team needs to know who, who the guy's going to be. And they want to get that player out there so he can start sort of carrying himself as the starting quarterback. They have shifted from, hey, we might run two guys to we probably need to name a starter, before, you know, a week to 10 days at least before the season starts. I think my theory is I think they, know, they they've shifted a little bit because once the guys came back and they saw them in full practice mode starting Friday, they realized that one guy had taken a step further than the other one. And they recognize and they're giving them both of them full opportunity and Brandon, I think you're right about the full pads and full contact. That's the telltale. You can look great in shoulder pads and helmets and shorts, but you got to see the live fire and, and that will confirm to them what they think that they've been seeing so far the last eight days. But I think they have an, a little bit better of an idea. Someone is going to put a flag in the soil and win that job. That's my theory on why they've changed their tune a little bit. Because Phil said today, you can go to Tar Heel Illustrated and read our piece right now uh, that I put up earlier today. That's, um, I think that that's where they're going. I think they're going to name somebody. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised. Next Saturday is the second scrimmage if they name somebody after that. What do you guys, both of you, Brandon first, and then Dina, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think they, I think it's important for them to go ahead and name a starter. Cause like Mac Brown said, when when the competition was going on with Sam Howe and Jace Reuter, you 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 have to put you have to get the whoever's going to be the starter. You have to let them know that they're the starter. Let them talk to the media. Let them be the guy. Let them have an opportunity to be the guy before the first before they run out on the field against Florida A and M. He has to he has to establish himself as a leader of the team. They might have they might have already done that, but he has to really establish it establish himself as a leader of the team and kind of distance himself from the quarterback competition in the past and have the, mon the mindset of, okay, this is my team and I'm ready to lead it. My it, theory, it, it, real, Dina, hold on, Brandon, very quickly, my theory though, do you think that they've changed their tune a little bit because uh, there might be something to my theory? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. There, yeah, I think once the pads got on, somebody, I don't know who it was, I wasn't at practice recently, but somebody, once they put on the pads, has separated themselves, and I think now they're trying to. Yeah, they, I, I agree with your theory. I do agree, with Dana. You. Yeah, you, you need to because your paycheck depends on it, right? Now, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I do too, and and plus, it you know, if you announce the starter ten to fifteen days before the the opener, you can kind of see if that if the guy that's named the starter how he's going to handle, and the other as one. being as being the guy because now. He's the guy, and now everybody knows he's the guy. So he's going to have some pressure, you know. He's in, in, in the closer they get to uh, the game, more, you know, the coaches, Coach Brown, Coach Longo, Coaches, they've all said they're, they're, they're dialing in and, 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 and trying to, to push these guys. And you're going to see, I mean, you're going to see uh, Jacoby or Drake. Let's see what they do when Desmond Evans is bearing down, you know, within inches of him, and or Javari Ritzy or uh, Keyshawn Silver or uh, uh, you know Power Eckles on a on a blitz. They're going to see that. So, do you guys think they'll name a starter? I'll say ten at least ten days out from Florida AM, and right now it's it's August fifth, so that's within the next twelve days. I think Eric, you, you're right about the scrimmage. Scrimmage is going to be like a game type situation, and they're going to see. And I, I, I would expect them to announce shortly after that. I do agree they, with that. They scrimmage. Um, they scrimmage. They scrimmage Saturday the sixth. They, this I'm pretty sure this might change. Saturday the thirteenth. Mm -hmm. uh, they have practiced the fourteenth in the evening. 
I think they're going to treat it like they, they're going to treat that week. Like they do a game week. They have practice in the evening. The next day they're going to do their post day stuff and they might name the starter. Then of course, the 15th is the first day of classes. There's no practice. I'm thinking by the time that they start classes that yeah. they will name a starting quarterback, they'll either do it internally or publicly. And I think they'll probably do both at the same time because Mac truly understands the value in getting stuff out there and whoever it is, get them in front as the guy, not talking, not fielding questions about the other guy, fielding questions only about himself and having that job. They need to have a week or two of that to really get themselves mentally ready for that next step. And it's a big deal. You're the face of the program. You go from being in a competition and ask questions about the other guy more than yourself to suddenly being the face of the program. So do you, you, you think they do that sooner rather than later, Brandon? Yeah. Yeah. They, I think they have to, I think, they, I, I agree. I, th- I think before classes start, they're going to go ahead and name the starter. I, I really believe that. And I believe that the, I believe that the competition has already kind of separated itself. I think they are going to use a scrimmage on Saturday to confirm what they already think. I don't know what they think, but I do believe they will use the scrimmage on Saturday because it's hard. I to think do- both scrimmages. Yeah. 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 Cause it's hard. You see, you've seen these guys so much, but like I said earlier, it's hard to evaluate them in, in shirts and t-shirt when everything is scripted. And I think when you put pads on that, that, that process just accelerates so much faster. And it's, it's easy. Like it's easy for just a average guy to go out there and look and see who's doing better than the other guy. It's, it's really easy to see. Well, the good thing is the process with the pads, they had shoulder pads on all week. And so they can, they go pretty full speed yeah. uh, when they have that. Uh, but to me, I think, I think you're hundred percent right. It's just how they handle stuff when it breaks down. They'll get a full dose of that, uh, both the next two scrimmages, these two Saturdays. I agree with you guys. I think they will name somebody. Uh, so I'm going to put all three of us on a spot here and let's put a qualifier. Let's put a qualifier. We got to do this, man. People are waiting for it, waiting for it, right? We got to do this. But the qualifier is this. If this is on our, we're not putting flags in the sand right now. And we're just, hey, this is our opinion on August 5th, 2022. Right now it's 424 PM. So at 424 PM, August 5th, 2022, Miss King who do you think will take the first snap at quarterback against the Rattlers on August 27th? Drake May. Brandon? Yeah, I got to go with Drake May. I think yeah, the, the talent Drake is well. too much to overcome. What is, in very quickly, in one sentence, what to you, Brandon, puts Drake above Jacoby, either by a smidge or by a lot? What is the separating factor? I like how his arm talent doesn't change depending on his feet, meaning when he's in the pocket, his ball looks the same, whether it looks, it's the same accuracy, whether if he's rolling out to the left or right, it doesn't matter what platform he's on. He can make the throw and like, he can make all the throws. And when you're six, five and you can move like that and you can make all the throws. It's like, I don't know how you keep him off the field. Okay. Brandon took two sentences, Dina. So you can take right. two if you want. Why, why do you think Drake? It's simple. <laughs> I, I just think he, he has it. IT, he has it, and that's just simple. I mean, I've I've thought that every every since I've seen him in high school. I just really think he can take this North Carolina program to uh, a big level. Mm-hmm. The the thing I like about both these kids is they're very calm. They can handle the stress of the job. There's no doubt about that. Smart, both smart kids. Poise. I think they're really confident. I think you could see, I think you could see Drake's confidence growing more as we've seen practice last fall and then in the spring and now, but also I think there was more room because Jacoby had a year on him in the program, but I agree with you guys. I think it's going to be Drake. He can make all the throws. Jacoby can make all the throws, but Drake's a little bit sharper at all the throws, especially the stuff over the middle. He's almost six, five. Yeah. And you got tight ends on this team. They have three tight ends that can play. Everybody knows that Morales is really good. Okay. Everybody knows that Nesbitt can be a freak, right? Copenhaver is really good too. He can, I think we're going to see some three tight end sets where they learn a lot of cool stuff out of that. Yeah, and you've got to be able to hit, you got to be able to hit the stuff over the middle. You got to be able to hit the quick out stuff. They run a different type of route with their time than a, than a, than a slot receiver over the middle. Is. I think Drake can hit all of those. 
Yeah. And I think that's ultimately why he's going to be the guy. Plus, I think he's got more upside. Throw him out there now. He's going to have to make some mistakes to get to a certain point in November. But if they go both, if they both were to take every offensive snap from Ford AM through Pittsburgh at the end of October, I think Drake will have made more progress and will be further ahead at that juncture than Jacoby will. That's why I think Drake gets the job. Yeah, and another thing for the program as a whole, I think it might be better for Drake to be the starting quarterback because let's say both of them are really good. Both of them are NFL caliber quarterbacks. If you put Jacoby out there this year and he has a really good season, he's likely to go going off to the NFL this year. But if you put Drake out there and he has a really good year, you get another season with him next season to build off of that good season. And then- Brandon's getting way ahead of us on this stuff right now. <laughs> I see what you're saying, and I do think that – I don't think that that's a factor, yeah, yeah. but I think a byproduct. And I'm a big yeah. believer in the byproducts of what they do because I think if they run with Drake now, a byproduct of that is he's going to be even further ahead when they get to Halloween because I just think that if if Jacoby's game goes here, I think Drake's game goes up here if it's all if they both reach their maximum potential. But I I, I think that's a fair point to throw out there, Brandon. That's probably something some people watching or listening thought about as well. So guys. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you, you want to add to that? I was going to say great problem to have. That's all. <laughs> it, it's a fantastic problem to have. And I do not believe that every situation in which there's a quarterback battle or if two quarterbacks play for a few games, it, when people say, oh, if you got two quarterbacks, you don't have any. I don't believe that that's true. No one ever says that about defensive end. Yeah. No, no one, one ever says that about, about slot receiver, but they say it about quarterback because it's in it's a low hanging fruit comment. <laughs> it's it's a it's something you could say in a bar where you can get a fist bump from a guy because it sounds like you know football, but it doesn't mean a damn thing. There are a lot of times, and this program has seen this where you, you have two or three quarterbacks and you don't got any, right? Yeah. But there are also times and Mac his, his look, the last two teams he had at North Carolina's first time around, he had two really good quarterbacks. He had Chris Keldorf and Oscar Davenport. And he managed two top 10 rankings, moving those guys in and out. Kildorf set records. He had some huge games. So he can make it work. He did it at Texas with two quarterbacks. He made it work there a couple of times. But you know what? He won his national title when he had one guy. And that guy was the dude. And he was a very high-level guy who had an incredibly high ceiling. And he had to throw him out there in order for him to work stuff out to become the player Vince Young ultimately was. I think in the end, I'm not saying Drake Mays or Vince Young, don't take it that way at all, but I think he's the guy. You get him for this year, you get him for next year, maybe even you get a third year out of that, who knows? Because the Mays are not going to rush this thing because the family is a part of this process as well. His dad fully understands the process. Luke understood it when he played basketball. Bo understood it when he played baseball uh, down at Florida. So I, I don't think they're in a rush situation here. So you get them as your starter now, and you may have your starter for a while. Yeah, I agree. All right, guys. Great yeah. stuff. Appreciate it. Uh, Brandon, hopefully I see you Monday at the next uh, pr- open practice to the media. Full pads. It's always my favorite one to see because the guys pop. And, Dean, I'm not sure if you'll make that one or not. Hopefully you will. And uh, we'll be back on next week to talk about what we've learned two weeks in to fall camp. If you like this video, go ahead and click like. Make sure you subscribe so you get notifications every time we upload and share this video. Tell your friends about it. And if guys, if you watch our videos all the time and you want to know what it's like to be a part of the THI community, you can do it now for free. Go over to THI, hit that link on the top of the page, the promo code kickoff2022. Become a free premium member for free for the rest of this month. You can be a Carolina insider too. And then make the wise decision to sign up for just $8.33 a month after that. Because I got to pay Brandon those big bucks. And I got to pay Dina those big bucks. So we need more subscribers in order to do that. So guys, for Dina King, for Brandon P, my name is Andrew Jones. We appreciate you guys stopping by. Thank you for watching.